you're all welcome and a big welcome as well to our panelists. And what we're going to do this evening um, for the next hour or so is discuss the Programme for Government, which uh, came out last Monday, 15th of June. And I'm joined here uh, by um, a really um, great panel of um, policy experts and policy advocates. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'll do a quick introduction and then um, my colleague, Saib O'Neill, uh, policy advisor at Stop Climate Chaos, is going to give a very um, brief overview of the whole document. Um, and then we're going to go straight into our Q&As. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you can still, if you can post your questions and answers in the uh, Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, and what we're going to do then, uh, my colleagues um, behind the scenes, Kate and Oshin, are going to go through those questions and then we'll feed them into our discussion um, as we go, as we progress through the next hour. Um, so I'm going to just quickly introduce our panel and then tell you a little bit about some of the, the kind of the format and the questions that we have around the Programme for Government. And the Q&A box you'll see at the, um, the bottom of the, of the screen. There's a whole load of other little symbols there. So it's right between pause, stop recording, or sorry, it's right beside Q&A. should be visible. If it's not, let me know. Um, there's also a chat, but we'll keep that to general comments. So it's bottom of your screen for the Q&A. Um, so I'm joined here this evening um, by the whole list. Um, we have uh, Cyber Neil, as I mentioned, she's policy advisor with Stop Climate Chaos. Um, I also have Damien, uh, Dr. Damien Otuma, he's with uh, cyclist.ie. Dr. Hannah Daly, uh, she is a researcher and lecturer um, in sustainable energy systems in University College Cork. Um, I'm also joined by um, Neve Garvey, she is head of policy and advocacy with TROCRA. And uh, Dr. Kira Murphy, um, she is a social or environmental justice advocate with the Jesuit Center uh, for Faith and Justice. Um, so during the week, we, when we um, published information about this webinar, we invited people to submit their questions in advance. And we received over 300 questions. Um, and I suppose that reflects the level of interest and debate, certainly at the moment, around uh, the programme of government and what it contains. Um, so we spent a little bit of time going through those questions and trying to group them and sort them into a way that would make it easy uh, and interesting for a webinar this evening. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Sive, and Sive is, as I mentioned, going to give us a quick overview, and then we'll delve into to those questions that we received in advance. As I mentioned, we hope to be here for uh, the next hour. Um, and just to let you know as well that uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Stop Climate Chaos YouTube channel um, over the coming days. So Saib, tell us about the Programme of Government. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to, I just have two slides. So it's the shortest possible presentation, hopefully. And I'm really going to just introduce us to the governance aspects of the, um, of the program for government rather than get into the nitty gritty because we have the experts here who can explain uh, what's in it and how they're interpreting it and analyzing it. So what I wanted to do was just recap the kind of climate governance piece because that's been so central to the work that Stop Climate Chaos has been doing for the past number of years. Um, so just, a, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is just a little kind of a timeline of the different policy developments uh, and non-developments in some cases that we have been tracking for the last five years since the adoption of the Climate Act, which in itself um, was, uh, was a, a hard fought for a piece of legislation that contained some notable weaknesses. And uh, in the same year, we had the adoption of the Paris Agreement. A couple of years later, still very little progress on the Climate Action Front in Ireland. We had the Citizens Assembly, which made a series of very fundamental and important recommendations 
around how the state be, could become a leader in climate action. Some of those recommendations were about specific things like the transport two to one investment in favour of public transport and uh, other recommendations related to the, the governance of climate action, how you get a cross governmental approach to delivering on uh, uh, mitigation or emissions reduction. So arising from the Citizens Assembly report, we had the establishment of the Joint Oireachtas Committee, um, which then deliberated on those recommendations over a period of 18 months. And during that period, the IPCC uh, published actually three special reports, but the most important one was the uh, special report on 1.5. So that's the SR15 report you can see there. Um, and that really set the sort of um, agenda for climate advocacy that we have been uh, pushing for ever since. Uh, it, you know, it's quite clear that we can't afford to allow dangerous uh, climate change to continue. So that means much more ambitious mitigation than was originally envisaged. And they're recommending something in the order of 50% emission reductions by 2030. So that really was the sort of campaigning platform that we in Stop Climate Chaos were, were following, the evidence science-based approach to climate action. And that formed the basis of the One Future campaign that was devised uh, by Stop Climate Chaos in conjunction with a number of other civil society partners in the lead up to the general election, which seems like a long time ago now. And we looked, uh, for example, at the party manifestos against those asks. There was nine key asks we had. And if you've been attending our webinars over the past few months, you'll have, um, or weeks, you, you, you'll be familiar with some of the kind of broad uh, outlines of those asks. And then, of course, we had the publication after many weeks of negotiations of the draft programme for government. And now it's with the parties for consideration and adoption. And we, along with many other organisations and networks and coalitions, have looked closely at the programme for government and we issued a press release. So all of those links are there and I can, we can put those up on the website afterwards. It'll just give you a chance to kind of track who said what, when, and you know, whether they're uh, sticking with their pledges and commitments or what is what they're uh, demanding consistent with what the science is saying. So I'm just going to show you one more slide. And this is from, this is a direct copy from the uh, program for government um, uh, section on the Green New Deal. And it sets out the overall approach that the three parties intend to take towards climate action. Now, other people on the panel here will address the detail of some of this, and they will address other areas like the social policy, housing, and the climate finance side. But in terms of these critical questions about emissions reduction, what the programme says, and this is verbatim, this is from the document, is that the parties are committed to the 7% per annum reduction, and that will result in a 51% reduction by 2030, and to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, this will be set down in law by a climate action bill, now, there is a draft heads of bill already available, but the idea is to get a full bill uh, published within the first 100 days of government. And in addition to that, they intend to strengthen the uh, Climate Action Council. And that was one of the recommendations of the Joint Oireachtas Committee. And we can talk about that in detail later. And the bill critically will define how five-year carbon budgets will be set. So the, the, the sh there's a shift now away from just looking at the 7% uh, per annum reduction towards, well, how are we going to implement that? It will be implemented by means of five-year carbon budgets. And this is something Oshin, I'm sure, and Hannah can tell us more about in detail. Critically, every sector. So it's not going to apply to just transport and energy. Every sector will contribute to meeting this target. But some of the policy changes that are involved aren't spelt out in the programme. And then there's a section on agriculture, which I think Hannah is going to address in some detail. Uh, it recognises the special economic and social role of agriculture and the distinct characteristics of methane. This kind of language suggests that there might be a slightly different approach to setting a target for methane, but critically, all sectors will be covered um, by the carbon budgeting process, and that budgeting process will be defined in legislation that will be introduced within the first 100 days. So I will stop there, Catherine, and um, let the others take it from there. That's great. Thank you so much, Sai, for that overview. Um, just to add, so keep the um, 
the questions to the Q&A box and then the general comments to the chat box. And what we, what I'm inviting you to do as well, um, feel free to, um, to, to essentially vote on particular questions that, that you really like the panel to address. It's something that we've been doing with previous webinars. So you'll see the little thumbs up on the, the Q&A um, and um, that will um, help us kind of show what we you know, the questions that are, that are, well, all questions are important, but some of the questions that uh, the panelists would like to address. But what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to go over to um, Hannah. Um, thanks for joining us, Hannah. Um, as I mentioned, Hannah is um, a researcher and a lecturer in um, University College Cork. Um, and Hannah, um, during the week, we received a number of questions around the 7% um, target. I'm sure a lot of you heard about this um, in the build-up and during the negotiations over the past couple of, couple of months. Um, so the, the questions kind of uh, focused on um, uh, how, what, what would the implementation of that 7% um, annual uh, target look like? And um, so if you can address that, that would be fantastic. But then there were some concerns uh, within, uh, uh, from those questions that um, uh, this, uh, I suppose, this idea of, of, of backloading. So are we going to see that level of commitment over the next five years or is it more that um, the, the scale of emissions reductions will be pushed into the latter half of the decade? So we just want to answer those two and then uh, we can take it from there. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, thanks for the invitation and, and for everybody joining. Just checking, you can hear me okay? Great. And apologies in advance if I get interrupted from, from my four-year-old who is being babysat by, um, by an iPad at the moment. Um, so to, to dive into your question, um, Catherine, and, and uh, thanks to those who submitted questions about the, the questions and concerns around emissions reduction um, in Ireland. First, it might be useful to step back and have a quick overview about, about what the profile of Ireland's emissions is. We, we emit about 60 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases every year. Um, and this programme for government uh, sets out a very strong ambition to around half those emissions over 10 years. That is explicitly stated. So whether, whether it's a 7% annual, like, so it's, whether it's 7% reduction every year, or whether it's 7% averaged over the whole time, whether it's backloaded or frontloaded, first of all, the first thing to set out is that a halving of greenhouse gas emissions is absolutely uh, hugely ambitious. It is a very strong statement and it's, uh, it's unprecedented really in different countries in either their historical decarbonisation or their planned decarbonisation. So whether the sort of the, the rate of decarbonisation is, is in the earlier period or the later period, that's the first, first very important thing to set out. It's extremely ambitious. The second thing that's really important to say is that Ireland has one of the highest shares of agriculture emissions uh, of any country in the world. And it's uh, the, re the rest of the emissions uh, come from, uh, from energy combustion. When you, when you burn a fossil fuel, CO2 is emitted. The rest in agriculture largely comes from what we call biogenic methane that comes from cows and sheep. Their, um, their, their burps and farts, to put it, <laughs> to put it politely. So, so about a third come from methane. Um, it's much more difficult to mitigate uh, emissions from methane without just reducing the number of cows. That's why we all hear about this, whether it's uh, whether reducing the, the uh, herd is, is, is needed or not. Um, whereas there are mitigation options from, from transport, from heat and electricity. We've got renewables, we've got energy efficiency, we've got demand reduction, hydrogen, things like that. So when we look at Ireland and its high share of agriculture emissions, um, unless we take dramatic action in agri agriculture to achieve that average 7%, that means that energy will have to decarbonize at an even faster rate. So if we just talk about like a slowly declining rate of, of mitigation in agriculture, according to the Climate Action Plan, which is around 1% per year, that's mainly on-farm efficiencies, efficiencies in spreading nitrogen and different, you know, let's say breeding cattle better, things like that, and, and, and changing the, the practice of spreading manure, uh, we'd get like a slowly declining, I say 1% um, emissions reduction from methane. That means uh, energy would have to decarbonize at 14% per year and that would be really really unprecedented. So me and my colleagues I want to acknowledge that I work closely with the Energy Policy and Modeling Group in University College Cork as part of the uh, MARI Centre which is an F SFI Centre for Climate Energy in the Marine and we do these energy systems modeling um, scenarios which looks at what the energy system would need to do to deliver on different emission targets like that to 2030 and to 2050. 
And when I'm talking about the energy system, I mean, not just power, the power sector, which is about a fifth of our energy, it's also about heat and transport across services, industry, as well as residential and, and transport, which is both personal and freight. And all these things matter when it comes to decarbonizing, especially at the rate that we're talking about. Um, so I mean, to backtrack a bit uh, and to talk about what, what this means in terms of front loading or back loading, and I think Oshin needs to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later, is that what a lot of people were disappointed with was that there was no specific commitment on emissions reduction in the first five year period. Um, that's because different parties have talked about the need to put in place um, big infrastructure projects, policies, uh, start creating you know, uh, tax signals and things like that and pricing signals, start retrofitting, re retrofitting programs. And that the emission savings from that won't be accrued until the second period. So that is true. Um, the program for government doesn't include a specific commitment for decarbonizing in the first period, but what it does include is, is a, a very strong signal, a very, very strong intent, and something that um, is a, a, a departure from um, previous Irish um, policy is, uh, is this notion of, of, of carbon budgets. It's been implemented very, very successfully in the UK. Um, the UK has, has met its carbon budgets, but it's, it's, it's uh, been going since 2008, so they're, they're spread out much, um, um, much and, and will be less ambitious in terms of annual uh, reduction. Um, I mean, we can go into talking about the specific measures for the energy sector, which might deliver those uh, emissions reductions. And I suppose what this document, the program for government is, is it's a, it's a sort of a signal of intent. It's not, it's not a, a technical document on how specifically this, uh, these emissions measures will be met. It does signal um, who, who will be advising that and it signals the, the, um, the establishment of the Climate Action Council, a strengthened climate change advisory board, who would be ultimately uh, advising the government on what the specific carbon budgets would be and specifically measures to, to achieve that. The programme for government itself contains some measures which will improve decarbonisation, but largely there's a big, very big overlap with, uh, with the um, Climate Action Plan, which delivers around half of the savings that, uh, that the programme for government is looking at. Uh, the the uh, Climate Action Plan delivers around three and a half percent annual reductions every year. So what um, the next government will really need to do is to focus on areas that, that haven't already been discussed. Right now, we've got a very strong societal buy-in to renewable electricity. We're aiming for 70% renewable electricity by 2030. We've got a really, really strong um, wind sector and the, um, and the Green Party want to up the share of renewable electricity from wind and from solar, which are good things, but we've already almost saturated our potential for emission savings from renewable electricity. We really need to go beyond renewable uh, wind and solar. Um, we've also have very strong ambitions on EVs. There's uh, around 850,000, nearly a million EVs targeted for 2030. That's already be seen, been seen as an extremely ambitious target, something that, um, uh, something that is in the Climate Action Plan uh, and hasn't been increased in, in ambition in, in, this, um, uh, in the Programme for Government because it's already seen as extremely ambitious. Same with the retrofitting target and, and target for heat pumps. So what the government will have to do to go beyond what is already there is to look at Freight transport, which emits about equally to, to private transport. So that's looking at low carbon fuels, uh, look at industry emissions and manufacturing emissions in the services sector, um, and looking at, um, um, at, 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 at upping the amount of renewable fuels and efficiency coming, um, um, coming from there. Can I just, because some of the questions that have been coming back, are, are, I suppose, are around um, uh, the backloading question and what can be done I, and I suppose the 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 time delay or the time lag between making the necessary infrastructural changes and, and implementing the, the 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 relevant policy measures within the next five years but not seeing the outcomes of those until the latter half of the decade so some of the questions that have been coming in are asking like is there anything that could can be done kind of now that starts bringing down emissions and you know, one 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 comment was wondering: Should we be cynical about this, or or is it the practical reality of of mitigation policy that there is this delay and you won't see the outcomes for a period of time? Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add on that, um, Hannah? Well, one thing that I'm I'm starting to do with with my research team is to look at what lessons that we can draw from this extraordinary year that has been 2020 and the lockdown. For example, we've all started to work from home 
uh, well, uh, all of us who, who are able to um, have, have started to work from home and um, and there is a commitment within the program for government that public sector bodies would continue this uh, working from home with a specific target of 20% of employees would continue to work from home from next year. Um, now that is, uh, you know, all of us that have experienced uh, this, this very dramatic lockdown as part of COVID will see this as a huge change in our lifestyles. Uh, but we've calculated that the redu reduction in transport emissions will probably amount to five to seven percent of our total emissions this year. Um, and that will bounce back. So what you need to do is have sustained emissions reductions, not, not ones that, that just happen for one year and bounce back. Um, but, the, but the lesson from this is not that work, working from home or things like this are irrelevant. There's an expression in the mitigation world that there's no silver bullet, there's no one single solution, there's a silver buckshot. And basically we need to go systematically through all forms of energy that we use um, and, and, and make them sustainable, whether by switching the technologies that we use, the fuels that we use, um, re reducing unnecessary demand and increasing energy efficiencies. Um, and that's why there's, there's no kind of single thing that we can do to dramatically reduce emissions uh, in the next year. Some things that we can look at are less acceptable in different communities. For example, one of the most successful um, policies in the past in, tra in reducing transport emissions is not really discussed, but it's it's been the obligation on fuel suppliers to increase um, biofuel blend in petrol and diesel. So when you fill up your car with, with petrol or diesel, there's a blend of biofuel in that. Now there's stricter requirements at the EU to make sure that these biofuels are sustainable, but like you could you could increase, the, the government could increase that mandated share tomorrow, and then there would be a, a, an immediate emissions reduction associated that with that. Uh, so that's 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 one thing. And that one thing to say as well that the more sort of mitigation options that you exclude, the more difficult, the more expensive it will be. Um, oh, sorry, so yeah. I, I might just um, sorry to interrupt you because it's um, it, it, it's fascinating. And I know Oshina also wants to come in here as well with uh, with. I know you've done a little bit of work on this, Oshina. Do you want to add uh, to some of the questions that I've asked Hannah already? Sure, I, I mean, I'll be, I'll be brief, I, but I have um, been looking at the issue of the 7% and, and the issue of backloading, which is a really unhelpful term and depending on what it means, very unhelpful idea. Um, but just to a tiny bit of context, first of all, for, for us as Friends of the Earth, and I think the Stop Climate Case Coalition, the biggest win in this um, document is the commitment to legally binding five-year carbon budgets. Now, it was being pledged before now. There's been a consensus since the JOCA committee, the Joint Directors Committee came out a year ago, but it's, it's again, that this government would commit to introduce it. And this is basically, rather than looking at a, a, a target 10 years down the line, you look at your total emissions over five years, because it's the total emissions that count, not falls one year or rises the next year, it's the total emissions. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because we've been talking, and again, it was Stockton McKayes and One Future, uh, as well as other parties who popularized 7% or indeed we called for 8% a year. No, but nobody, including us, actually expects it to be precisely 8% every year. Uh, it is, that's why we always use the term average, because you can't control emissions that precisely. Uh, a hot winter, or a cold winter, or a mild winter, or a hot summer can change emissions. So that's why the five-year budget for emissions, the overall amount of envelope of emissions is the crucial thing. The 7% or 8% is an indication of scale of how much we have to do. And to give you an example, you know, in 2009, our emissions were 60 million tons in a year. And at that time, we were looking for the carbon budgets at that time to deliver 3% a year reductions, which would be much more manageable. But here we are 10 years later, the, the, the projections, we don't have full figures yet for 2019, are that it's still 60 million tons a year we're, we're, we are emitting. So now that's why we have to do 7% 7 7 a year on average to, to, to get back on track towards Paris. It's because we've done so little for the last 10 years. But actually you manage your emissions in, the, in these five year carbon budgets, which will be legally binding under the new climate law. Uh, and we will be pushing, and it is our understanding that the intention is to have, like to put out two carbon budgets at the same time next year, or late this year, whenever it happens, have them adopted by the Doyle. And so 21 to 25, and 26 to 30 will be legally binding on whoever's in government, unless the Doyle votes to change them uh, um, for the next 10 years. And that is the crucial change that locks the trajectory in and locks the effort in. And we know from the UK, along with the 2050 target, that's what's driven uh, actual action across all government departments. Now, um, on the issue of backloading itself, there's obviously a difference between um, how long a backloading action until the last part of the decade, which would be unacceptable, and then how long it takes for thing, big decisions you make now to actually bear fruit, 
Uh, and first of all, like, uh, and that's that's acceptable. As in, you know, we know that retrofitting takes a while to ramp up. We don't have enough builders at the moment. We don't have enough skilled labourers. Um, that may have changed because of the pandemic, but we didn't certainly. Uh, if you get up to, to get up to fifty thousand houses a year, it takes time and it takes a while, a while to do all of those things. We know transport investment, other than cycling and walking, which we'll come on to, takes time to bear fruit. So some things take some things take time to bear fruit, but not everything does. And despite the media debate and the way that some of the parties have been framing it. Nobody was suggesting we wouldn't we wouldn't reduce emissions at all, and we and we still will reduce them to some to some degree anyway. And I think there are things in this document that might make it the, the amount we do in the first five years uh, bigger than they would have been. So to give you some numbers, and I'll keep it uh, not a few numbers yeah. as possible, and keep it brief. Yeah, thanks, Alvin. Sixty million tons a year. If we do nothing, that's five years is thirty is three hundred million tons. Five sixties is three hundred million tons. It'll be six hundred million tons over the course of the decade. And in fact, that's, that's a, just a no change scenario. The EPA's projections are more or less the same, actually. They say 583, as in that's with all the policies that are out, that were out there, not the Climate Action Plan. So basically, do nothing, business as usual, usual 600 million tonnes. Um, the last year's Climate Action Plan uh, that Hannah mentioned, that basically said over the 10 years, we would get down to 500 million tonnes, as in we would save 100 million tonnes of carbon. This programme for government, with the 7% seven year, seven pledge, basically means we would have to be under 400 million tonnes. So it's double the reduction that from last year. This, that's why we've been welcoming it. It is twice as much carbon savings as, was, as, the, as the outgoing government was pledging to do. Now, how much of that gets done? The big, de the big debate will be how much of it gets done um, in the first five years and the second five years in terms of emissions. But the, the wiggle room is limited. Um, if you just do a straight line 7%, you have a, a carbon budget of 230 million euros for the first five years and 160 million for the second five years, roughly. So yeah, there'll be some wiggle room between those two things. It, we, might, we might be okay with it being 250 as a maximum and maybe 150, so it's 400 in total, 250 and 150. That's still 50 million less than business as usual in the first five years and 20 million less than the outgoing government's plan. So there will be more emissions reductions and more climate action in the first five years under this program for government. And there are some big wins out there. You know, it's closing money point early. It's not due to close to 2025. Um, speeding up the just transition of the peat stations. Uh, all of those, they are big wins that can happen in the short term. So there are big wins out there. Some of which though will have to be nailed down through the just transition process, through the carbon budget process. They're not all dated and timed in this document, but certainly this document has the potential for double the amount of carbon emissions uh, that, that the outgoing government was pledging to. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks, Oshin. I'm going to move on now, and I see we've lots of really interesting questions that are coming in, and we, we'll, we'll try to get time to, to cover some of them, or if not all of them. Um, uh, but I do want to move on to some of our other panellists uh, to talk about and or to answer questions on their actual areas um, of expertise. So I'm going to move on to transport, um, because there was a lot in there on transport, and uh, we certainly, Stop Climate Chaos, certainly welcomed what was included in there. Um, Damien, um, some of the questions that came in, uh, and I've seen I've seen these questions repeated in the Q and A. Uh, there was a comment about uh, you know if we cut the or reduce the top speed in all roads to eighty kilometers per hour, uh, the that being a, a possible a quick win. Um, there was also questions around is it realistic to encourage cycling without proper education for cyclists? Um, what are the real quantifiable proposals for greening of public transport within within the programme? So if you want to maybe touch on, on some of that, but also then give us your overview of what is what is in there on transport and active travel. Yeah. Um, look, I, might, I might start with the question whether it's realistic to re-establish cycling um, unless you teach um, you know, road, road training. I mean, if, if you look at the history of countries and cities which have regenerated their cycling cultures, um, it really involves a wide package of measures. It's about restricting or banning car movements in the centre of cities or parts of it. It's reallocating road space. It's reconfiguring junctions. And the classic examples there will be in the Netherlands and in terms of removing cars. Even Brussels at the moment, Ghent and Belgium are being very progressive in these areas. It's, it's uh, greenways. But it's primarily around taming the cars in city centres. And if you do this, you create the conditions whereby people can feel more confident cycling, more, more people driving are also cycling. So in the program for government, there is, um, I mean, the, the, the most crucial point is about the 360 million per annum to be spent on cycling. And that can be spent on a whole range of measures. It also includes beefing up the regional um, design offices of Transport Infrastructure Ireland so that there's 
increased expertise. So that's actually um, crucial. Um, yeah, very interesting question about reducing speed limits as a device to reduce emissions. And of course, in the, in the early 1970s, in 1973-74, in the UK, they reduced the speed limits of motorways to 50 miles per hour. And even more recently in Madrid in 2005, the speed limit was reduced on the ring part of the ring road uh, down, to, um, down to 70 kilometers per hour. So it's a, good, it's a good idea. And it's actually the second last bullet point on page 16 of the program for government. Reduce review and reduce speed limits where possible to reduce road safety issues and carbon emissions. So it is in there as one of the, one of the measures. Um, so in that sense, it's pretty positive. Um, you also mentioned uh, greening of public transport. There is a commitment to require that all new urban buses be electric, hybrid or electric. Now this is already happening. This is already in the National Development Plan. And there was a commitment in there that by July 2019, um, that um, the NTA will, will cur curtail the purchase of diesel only urban buses. Now, rural buses are more difficult technically, but there is momentum on a lot of those points. But the, the crucial overarching points from a cycling advocate's perspective is the 10% uh, of the transportation budget for cycling, 10% for walking, and then a two, a two to one ratio of expenditure on new public transport versus new roads. So from a transportation perspective, it's very, it's very progressive and cycling advocates and in general, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with it. That's excellent. This was one of the comments we've been hearing back is around the, the, the rural, what's in there for, for rural communities on the transport front. Do you want to um, add anything specifically? Is there anything around kind of uh, local link infrastructure? Um, what, what, what is in there? And also I think some of the comments we have been hearing around continued, um, building of, of roads, road projects that will go ahead. Do you have anything that you want to say there in terms of what, what is commissioned to within the, within the document? Yeah, I think the, the, the local link is crucial in improving uh, rural transport. So that's, that's particularly important. Um, we, you know, we, do, we do need to, you know, the exact wording around um, constructing new roads raises the question of what's a new road? Is it one that has already started to go through the planning process? Is it one that for which, um, you know, they're, they're ready to go to construction. So I think there's a little bit of wiggle room on the, on the definition of what a new road is. Um, but broadly, I mean, if you're trying to change um, patterns, tra travel patterns in rural areas, it, it is more difficult. But I think the COVID crisis has demonstrated that it is, it is, it's very possible for a lot more people to work from home than was previously assumed. And if you look at the history of transitions in general for, you know, the functional areas of, of transport or energy, Often it is shocks to the system, which open up windows of opportunity, people develop new habits, those habits become crystallized, and then what was previously imagined to be impossible suddenly becomes absolutely doable. So it's, it's really, really exciting what's happening at the moment, the external shock, you know, the, the niche developments, niche behaviors, you get kind of niche accumulation, these become normalized, they break through into the, into the kind of regime of how people do things. So, you know, the programme for government, it's an instrument by which we will hold ministers to account, but it's not the only thing happening. You know, change happens as a result of a lot of different, different activities at a grassroots movement level, but, but being inside in a government with a strong programme for government, particularly in regard to transport, it's all part of the mix of creation change. Can I just ask, because I see this question's coming up a lot around EVs and uh, EVs being the solution. And I know in last year's Climate Action Plan that uh, there was quite an ambitious target for electric vehicles. Uh, what's in the programme for government in terms of uh, um, other, other modes of transport and perhaps um, supporting that, that commitment around EVs, but also EVs not being the only solution as well? You know, I mean, EVs, EVs are given, um, you know, a lot, there, there is a, quite an emphasis on, e, on EVs in the, um, in, in the plan. I mean, maybe uh, Oshin or other, other commentators might want, to, might want to comment on the, the EV aspect of it. Um, but, but broadly, we cannot see the solution uh, to transportation simply being to change the uh, engine type. You know, it's very much about, you know, can you, can you reduce the number of journeys through, through home working? Can you shift? to mass transit buses and um, buses and trains. And then there's also a dimension of um, electric cars. But maybe some of my colleagues might want to comment on that as well. 
Um, I think, um, yeah, I think what, what I might even touch on now is, is uh, some of the, the, the questions around, um, you know, fairness and, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the what, what's, what's in there, say, for, for rural communities. And there has been a number of questions coming in around, um, I suppose, um, some communities being left behind, um, some communities bearing more costs than others. Um, I suppose the, the usual kind of justice questions. So I just want to, uh, we had a lot of questions around the carbon tax element of what was in the programme. And I might put some of this to uh, Saib and anyone else that wants to come in. Um, and I suppose there were concerns expressed around the proposed um, proposed um, way of um, allocating the revenue that was generated from a carbon tax increase. Um, and then I suppose there were also concerns um, raised around, you know, how do we ensure that people who are in fuel poverty are not left behind or do not fall the cracks and have to bear the cost of of having to pay a carbon tax. So um, I think there are quite important questions. Saif, do you want to address some of those for me? Well, well firstly, just to quickly explain what's in the programme for government. Um, as you know, we have a carbon tax at the moment already um, at 26 euro per tonne, and it's proposed to increase that uh, so that instead of being 80 euro per tonne by 2030, as was agreed uh, by the Joint Raptors Committee, the uh, carbon tax will now be 100 euro uh, by 2030. So the annual increase will be higher than six euro per annum. Um, now, there is a commitment in the programme to hypothecation, which means ring fencing. So instead of all that tax revenue going into the general exchequer, like your income taxes and VAT, it will be specially you know, kept aside and ring fenced for climate action. The Joint Raptors Committee recommended a, a kind of a convoluted process to kind of determine what was the best way to use the revenues to address fuel poverty. But instead, the, 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 the three parties that negotiated this programme have, have decided on a slightly different tack. They've dipped their hands into the pot, so to speak, and are proposing to spend 1.5 billion of the additional revenues uh, for a special new rep scheme. So, I suppose the thinking is that um, if rural communities are going to be especially sort of uh, disadvantaged or challenged in responding to the other incentives that are there vis-a-vis -vis, you know, public transport and active travel and retrofitting, the uh, idea is that the Reps2 fund will, to a certain extent, compensate a certain segment of the rural people who might otherwise be uh, somewhat affected by higher fuel prices. Um, it's a political agreement. It's a political judgment. Uh, it's not what the Joint Raptors Committee agreed. Um, but at the same time, the other revenues that are there will be used to um, finance the Just Transition and the retrofitting programmes. And of course, the existing revenues themselves are being used for that purpose at the moment as well. So um, in terms of just like one of the major arguments against carbon tax has always been that, well, it's not fair to tax people if the alternatives aren't in place, uh, which, which was probably true for a long time. But I think this programme for government definitely proposes to invest very considerable state resources into public transport and retrofitting, which are the two areas where people get caught out with uh, rising fuel prices. And the second thing to say is that there was, um, I think, an effort by the Green Party to promote a fee and dividend model, but that obviously didn't secure the agreement of the other two parties. Uh, there is some research conducted over the last few years, quite a bit actually, by the ESRI, published three very detailed papers coming at it with different methodologies and different approaches to try to figure out the best way of hypothecating carbon tax revenues. And they determined that it was actually possible to, to impose carbon taxes in a way that was progressive, as long as you, you, know, you redirected the revenues back in terms of uh, social, higher social welfare payments or fuel allowances or retrofitting subsidies and and the like. So it is possible, in theory at least, to, to make it a progressive tax. That's really great. And that actually brings me on to the, to the wider kind of social justice piece. And um, I mean, there has been a lot of commentary on this, um, particularly in terms of other areas of public policy, housing, health provision, direct provision, and so on. So Kira, um, in the Jesuit Centre, I know that you look at a whole range of issues, not just um, issues around the environment and, and climate justice. Can you, um, I have a number of questions here around the, the, the kind of what broader social justice piece. Um, so for example, one person would like to hear more clarification about 
um, the climate justice aspects of the program, particularly in relation to housing and protecting the vulnerable. Uh, another comment that we received was, you know, how can we expect to foster uh, economic and social changes necessary to reverse climate change if we fail to address uh, social justice issues? Would you like to speak to some of those uh, concerns or address some of those concerns for me? Uh, yeah, um, so the, this program for government does, um, it does cover a lot of social justice aspects, but it, uh, in some areas it's just, it is quite, quite weak in some areas. So there are some positive um, aspects and they include, um, so the clean air policy is one of the positive aspects that um, in Ireland a lot of uh, socially deprived areas would have the worst pollution. So that policy would have a positive impact for um, social justice. So that would include the policies of um, uh, retrofitting to reduce the need to burn fossil fuels, um, the transport policy to reduce uh, congestion and uh, traffic pollution in uh, the inner cities and inner towns where that might be the most socially provided. So that's uh, one example. Um, so the just transition, uh, is in there. It is a bit weak, but um, at least it is in there and it can be something that can be developed. Um, the LNG, the ban on the LNG terminals, so that is a huge social justice um, uh, policy, I suppose, in terms of the global social justice. So in terms of reducing emission and in terms of the people that it impacts in America, so we banned fracking ourselves, but if we introduce it, we are introducing the social justice impacts that have happened, that is continuously happening in America. Um, again, like I've said, the, the climate tax has the potential to be a positive thing for social justice if it is used to um, increase the welfare for uh, people who are on, uh, who are receiving welfare or the energy poverty, who are in energy poverty. So that is in the program of government and that is a, a positive aspect. And then again, the transport investment. So uh, more equal access to transport is a huge social justice aspect because it costs about 10 grand a year to have a car. And if you don't have access to other forms of transport, then you don't have a choice. And that is, it, it is a huge cost if, if you are living, um, on welfare or something. Um, however, it is very weak in terms of um, housing and the economic policy. Um, so there is a mention of extending the ban on uh, evictions and rent increases, but there's no clarity on how long that will that will go on for. So realistically, um, what Peter McFerry, who I work with, has advocated for is that this need the ban needs to go on for two or three years so that we can get a handle on the numbers that are going into homelessness and reduce the people who are experiencing homelessness now. If we get rid of the ban too quickly, that'll just have an absolute glut of people who cannot afford their rent anymore and they will go into um, energy or housing insecurity. And it is that is one of the bigger failings in this. Um, so I would like to say that if the if this program for government was implemented in full, um, it would actually be a huge um, a huge step forward in terms of social justice and um, equality. But it is in the action that is taken. So we we will only be able to judge the program of government by what action is taken. So that is there is a lot of good stuff in there. It is it does just depend on how well it's implemented. So in terms of uh, the housing, um, a lot of it is aspirational, um, but the detail is weak and the ban on the eviction is one of the things. Um, there's no um, guarantee of public land for public houses, which is one of the main asks from the Green Party, which isn't necessarily, which isn't in the government, in the programme for government. Um, and it does seem to continue on with the free market solution ideology which has actually um, caused this problem. So Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil t tend to go with the uh, private market solution which just hasn't worked and there's no, uh, there doesn't seem to be a huge shift away from that policy at the minute. Um, 
so yeah so as it stands um so peter while he did say that if it was fully implemented it would be brilliant but he did say that it is um nonsense <laughs> really he said that it's nonsense and full of waffle in terms of um that it's aspirational and it he doesn't it, it will depend on how it is delivered um in terms of the other question about how we'd expect to foster economic and social changes necessary to reverse climate change if we fail to adjust social justice uh the short answer to that is we we can't do one without the other um but as i have said this the program for government isn't perfect but it does have uh, in terms of the specifics and the timeline and the costing but it does have um some elements in it that could be good and i have mentioned them before um the main thing from this is that um this the the movement the environmental and climate movement this is the program for government is just one step in this so there will be a lot of work to do afterwards to make sure that the social justice element of environmental and climate activism continues on and that will be that will be one of the main things that to see that this is implemented as socially justly as possible so, that's really yeah. great Karen. you've touched on uh two things that i that i want to get to now and one one is on is on the international justice um commitments and i'm going to bring in me but first you touched a lot on kind of the uh accountability piece here yeah. and that actually uh reflects some of the questions that did come up so how do we hold the next government to account uh on what they said that they will do in in this document um i think it's a very important question and um I don't know if it's a question open to all our panelists. If anyone would like to come in, if you'd like to answer here or Sai, if you might like to come yeah. in. I will, if, if you don't mind, because it just touches on the legislative piece and I, don't, I want to hear from Neve as well. So, um, no, just to say that the, the climate bill is a really, really important um, tool for getting a lot of this sorted. So the climate legislation that has been promised will strengthen the powers of the Climate Advisory Council. And that's very important in getting a science-based independent perspective on the carbon budgets. And ideally the, the, the Climate Advisory Council will actually be devising these budgets. They'll need more scientific expertise. In addition to that, the bill should uh, establish as a standing committee, the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Climate Action. So that isn't um, something that's guaranteed if it's not in legislation. And the idea is to set it up pretty much like the Public Account Committee that ministers will be hauled in and held to account by the Oireachtas. At the moment we don't actually have a government. The Doyle committees are not functioning partly due to the pandemic and partly due to the fact that we only have a caretaker government. So there's no agreement amongst the parties as in what the legislative program is going to be, uh, what, what's the priority in terms of the timing of bills that will come before the Doyle. All of these things will get ironed out once a government is formed. So we have been operating in somewhat of a lacuna for the last uh, number of months. Um, and the, the, the resolution of this government question will mean that Doyle committees will be established, standing committees will be reviewing legislation, the government will be proposing bills, and it will be possible then for the opposition and members of the Doyle to propose private members' bills. They are more difficult to get through than the government's legislation. However, if the government has a majority it can speed things up, speed up the passage of a bill through the Dáil. And that's why I suppose the composition of the government uh, makes such a difference. If a minority government is going to find it much more difficult to pass a, a large piece of legislation uh, such as the climate bill that, that we're discussing. The other thing about uh, accountability is that uh, ministers are held to account by the Doyle, that's our parliament, and also by the Shannon. So once those uh, committees, once the Doyle and the Shannon are set up properly, the ministers who are responsible for delivering on various themes within the programme uh, can be held to account. That's our mechanism in our democracy for holding ministers of government to account. In addition to that, public bodies are brought in before committees that, um, and they're asked to give evidence. And the mandates of many of these, of these public bodies, such as Chagas, Quilcha and so on, were issues that we have looked at in One Future and Stop Climate Chaos as, as needing to be addressed. There was a little bit of mention of Quilcha, 
and I forget now there was another body that was mentioned, but essentially um, the mandates of some of these bodies will need to be reviewed. And again, that's something that can be done through the committee and the legislative process. Uh, so finally, I mean, political accountability is very important. If you don't know who the government is, it's very hard to know how to keep them, <laughs> uh, you know, held to account for decisions. Only governments can pass budgets. Uh, there's, there's an awful lot uh, of a backlog at the moment because we haven't had, uh, 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 we only had a caretaker government. So a lot of things will be possible um, to, to be done and a lot of things will be clear as to who's responsible for them uh, if and when a government is uh, formed over the next um, week. And just one final question that came up quite a bit in the chat box is about the keep it in the ground bill, what will happen to that? So that fell with the last Doyle, partly because of the money message and then partly because of the election. There's nothing stopping uh, a member of the Doyle from trying to reintroduce it as a private member's bill. It's possible that it might actually be considered as part of the climate bill if there is agreement between the parties to go about uh, banning fossil fuel exploration in that way. But it is something that's covered in the programme for government. Uh, it may or may not require legislation. And uh, yeah, the money message, I'm not sure what the, the parties intend to do about that. Um, it's possible the, the next government might be a little bit more considerate towards the opposition bills, but we shall have to see. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much, Saif. Um, I do, uh, I'm conscious of time, uh, and I realise that we haven't uh, heard from Neve Garvey uh, in Trokra. Um, so Neve, um, just on the, the international dimension of what's in the programme, uh, particularly around um, climate finance, um, can I just ask um, why is, is, is climate finance so um, crucial to delivering on Ireland's commitments um, under the Paris Agreement? And can you explain a little bit about what's the distinction between climate finance and um, development aid? And maybe give us a sense of what you think um, uh, of what's committed to in the, in the, in the, in the programme. Hey, thanks a million. It's been great hearing all of the the, subsequent, or the previous conversation as well. Um, so I guess, for, yeah, from an international development perspective, you know, as we all know, climate change is absolutely having devastating impacts for some of the most vulnerable people on the planet who've done the least to cause the issue in the first place. And therefore, all of the key measures that we've just been discussing, like the key critical thing that Ireland can do to help with that is reduce our emissions. So that is the, the primary commitment I suppose we should make that will be supportive of um, reducing the, the devastating impacts of climate change internationally. But climate finance is also absolutely critical and it's critical for a couple of reasons. One, as UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, uh, Philip Alston put it, we risk a climate apartheid scenario where the wealthy pay to escape overheating hunger and conflict and the rest of the world is left to suffer. Because even if we keep, you know, if we, um, I suppose, keep climate to even at 1.5 degrees, the adaptation limits in many countries will be, will be in severe strain. So we absolutely, for equity and justice, need to support um, the most vulnerable countries to um, deal with some of the impacts of climate change. So that's one reason. But I think possibly of more interest to, to many of the people on the call here as well, is that if we want the, in, like we, to tackle climate change, it requires international action. All countries need to be part of the solution if we're to keep temperatures to 1.5 or 2 degrees. To be effective in doing that, we need all countries to play their part, and that includes developing countries. So one of the questions in the in the chat box uh, from Jane was was asking about the sort of fifty percent IPCC figure, and that would be very unfair if it was if it was um, across the board uh, that some low emitting countries that would be ridiculous for people to reduce by fifty percent, and that is true. So the way that the international system works is that individual countries develop nationally determined contributions. So each country decides what it's willing to do and it puts that forward. Currently, all of that adds up to 
overshooting the 1.52 degrees um, significantly. I think we're on track for about a three degree world based on people's commitments, not even how successful we are at meeting those commitments, just purely on paper, our commitments. And so this is where the climate finance comes in, because what developing countries are saying is we're willing to do our bit. That might be reducing from our business as usual, or it might be actual reductions, depending on the country. But we're saying we're willing to do our bit if you support us with the technology and the financing that helps us have more green development pathways and helps us cope with, with the impacts. So it's really, really critical for the global solution to climate change, of which we're just a part. Climate finance from rich countries to um, developing countries is, is, is critical. And it's committed to in the international agreement, and um, the target is about 100 um, billion US dollars per year um, by 2020. Um, we haven't met that yet. The global community has been making some increases towards it. And Ireland has been increasing our climate finance over the last number of years. The highest amount was 79.5 million in 2018. Our analysis and, and that throw crown Christian aid is that we'd need to times that by six to do our fair share of climate finance. And what the programme for government um, commits Ireland to do is to double um, that 2018 figure. So doubling is, 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 is not at the level necessary in terms of the fair share of climate finance. But your second part of the question, Catherine, the distinction between climate finance and ODA is really at the heart of what's most problematic about our commitments to climate finance. Because Ireland's climate finance is very good, it's very high quality, it's very transparent, it's focused on adaptation, which is really important because the vast majority of climate finance isn't, it's, it's focused on mitigation. But the problem is all of Ireland's climate finance comes from our ODA commitments. And we have not as, an, as a country yet met our target on ODA, which is 0.7% um, of GNI, about seven cent in every thousand um, euro. Um, so we haven't yet met our ODA commitment and we're saying all of our um, climate finance commitments are to come from within our ODA budget. So the programme for government says it will double what counts as climate finance from the ODA budget. So you're essentially sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul rather than actually commit to increases in actual climate finance. So that's just um, a challenge. Now, it's not unique to Ireland, but it's one that we would really like to see Ireland take some more leadership on. We have shown leadership in the quality and focus and nature of our climate finance, but it, it needs to rise hand in hand with ODA rising, not just robbing from one pot into the other or relabeling something as something else. That's great. Thank you, Neve. Um, I, I realize that, uh, well, it's now six o'clock and um, there are um, a number of other questions. We, we're not going to probably get time to address them all. I think, Damien, did you want to add another comment just before we um, wrap up? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Just in regard to e-mobility, I mean, I think the crucial point in the programme for government is legislation to ban for the registration of new fossil fueled cars and light vehicles from 2030 onwards. And then the other part of e-mobility, obviously, is uh, e-bikes. So there's a proposed expansion of the bike to work scheme to enable purchase of uh, electric bikes and cargo bikes. And additionally, requiring every local authority to have a high quality cycling policy, uh, assessing the roads network, putting in a cycle network plan and uh, requiring the local authority to have cycling officers. So there's actually there's a lot of really good detail on e-mobility in there as well. So I didn't get a chance to say that earlier. Thank you. That's great. I think one of the common themes running through a lot of the insights that were shared here this evening is the um, the importance of accountability and um, the role of NGOs. And um, I know that I'm sure Oshin and Saiv, my colleagues in the Subclimate Chaos Coalition, as well as uh, our members here who are on the panel, Cyclist.ie, Trocra, the Jesuit Centre, um, will have something to say about the important role that NGOs play in, in not just advocating on, on, on climate justice issues, but um, really pushing to ensure that those issues are on the political agenda. And we've seen that over the last number of years in terms of the Citizens' Assembly, uh, the, the Joint Oireachtas Committee that followed, um, not to mention the, the divestment um, the progress on divestment and the uh, and on keeping keeping uh, fossil fuels in the ground. Um, 
and I also think that within this uh, within this program that we are seeing um, the impact of some of the wins that the climate movement have had and have achieved over the over the past couple of years. And I think what is uh, central is that uh, the movement uh, continues to grow um, and uh, continues to remain on track to ensure that. Uh, not only do we hold um, the next government accountable on what is committed to in the program, but also to to push for more um, on particularly on some of the the weaknesses that we've identified here um, on the panel this evening. Saiv and Oshin, um, or anyone else on the panel, would you like to to even add to that uh, on, on the importance of civil society um, on on pushing the, the the climate movement and the climate justice agenda? I, mean, I think you've you've covered a lot of it there, Catherine. But I think it is it's worth saying there's, there's two, two parts to this. On the one hand, some of the commitments in this program for government, like the um, uh, the carbon budgets and the climate law and the accountability in there that Sai have laid out, is a crucial victory. It institutionalizes transparency and timely uh, monitoring and, and expertise and accountability around climate policy. It can't, you know, we can't fail in smoke-filled rooms anymore. If we're going to fail, we have to fail in public uh, and be accountable to the Doyle, etc. And that's really crucial. And it is what Friends of the Earth and Stop Climate Chaos as a coalition have been campaigning for since 2007. We've been looking for this particular climate law, much as it is now outlined, since 2007. It's taken far too long. There you go. We, 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 uh, but the point is now, not that we retire, it is just to, 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 to borrow a phrase rather weirdly from Mark Ruffalo last night. <laughs> these, these moments are a comma in the movement building. It's, it's, not, it's not an end point, not even a full stop or a new paragraph. It's a comma. We keep building, we keep moving, we keep the pressure on, we keep ratcheting up uh, the demands because we need a transformation and we need you know, more than this. this we, 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 the one future campaign that Stop Climate Case launched for the election said at least 8% because that's what the UN said. And that's a global average. We got as far as seven. So it's not everything we need, but it's better than three and a half as Hannah, as Hannah laid out the current plans. Is. So we pocket that victory if it transpires as in if, if the program for government is adopted and the government happens. And then we, re, we recalibrate our demands. We keep the pressure on for delivery. We keep the science uh, to, the, to the forefront of policy. We keep bringing politicians' uh, minds to this. And, and um, what the biggest change in the last 10 years, apart from the bloody climate itself, is changing and keeping this on people's agenda, is that the movement has grown far beyond the few NGOs and the few activists that were around when Stop Climate Chaos um, started 13 years ago. There's now a very vibrant, very diverse uh, movement of all ages, which is fantastic. Let a thousand flowers bloom. And we'll continue to try to work with all our allies across the movement uh, uh, to keep the pressure on for as much action as possible. Or anyone else yeah. on the panel that would like to add to that? Yeah, just, just, I just wanted to say, I echo everything you said, Catherine, and everything that, um, that Oshin said there. I think you've captured it really well. Uh, you know, um, it's a very broad church, the environmental movement. Some of it, uh, it comes at these issues from slightly different perspectives. But when we join forces together, you know, we pack a serious punch. Uh, I've been working in the offices of TDs when our emails start flooding through on their inboxes. And it's quite a sight to behold. So when we join forces to fight together around common issues of concern, we do um, wield an enormous strength. And we also have a kind of legitimacy about our movement because it's so broad based. It covers development organizations. It covers local kind of growing together type organizations, little food co-ops. Uh, it, it covers, you know, students who are still in school. Um, so we bring a legitimacy to uh, all the work that we do. And just to emphasize as well, uh, if it's not obviously clear from what Oshin said, is we work with the opposition as well. We've worked with the opposition parties very closely in the past and we'll continue to work with the opposition uh, no matter who it is. We, we just don't really know who's in government and who's in opposition. Um, but it'll be extremely important because the opposition are the parties that hold the government to account. So they become our voices in the Oireachtas um, when legislation and uh, uh, government decisions are being discussed. So we'll be there. We'll be watching. And maybe just to add to that, I mean, there is a broadening of the alliances in the last few years between the, um, you know, the sustainable transport um, groups and the, the, the public health sector, like the Irish Heart Foundation, the Irish Cancer Society, because, you know, there's a realisation that active travel is also low carbon and it's, it's healthier. So 
partly around building alliances and it's also using you know, the Joint Directors Committee on Transport, Tourism and Sport to put further pressure on the Minister uh, to, uh, to, to stick to the commitment. So I think, uh, I think NGOs have got a lot savvier in the last uh, five years, certainly in the transportation area too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I like what you mentioned there about building lines. And it's something that Stop Climate Chaos has started to do over the past year is that we've been reaching out to um, organizations that are not necessarily on, on specifically working on, on climate mitigation um, to, you know, to, to make sure that a lot of what we're calling for um, is socially proofed um, and has that social just dimension at its core. And that led to the the one future um, demands that um, that we have campaigned on um, leading up to the general election earlier this year. Um, Kira or uh, Neve, do you want to come in before I wrap up? Because I'm conscious of time here. Just just even on on that aspect, um, and considering that you're also members of the coalition, very active members. I've been part of it uh, since 2007, recently returning. And yeah, it, it is just really amazing to see the strength of the work in, in recent years. And um, like a number of you referred to the diversity in the group, I think it's just gone from strength to strength. So no, just thanks a million for involving me in today. And um, I know time is tight, so I'll, I'll stop there. Great. And Hannah, because I know that you're in a slightly uh, different position um, in the sense that you're in an academic setting. Do you want to comment on, on how you see the role of, of NGOs, particularly in ensuring accountability over the lifetime of the next government? Yeah, I, I agree with all of the all of the presenters that it's an incredible role of NGOs in ensuring that civil society is represented in, at, the, at the decision maker level is very important and has been very influential. And you know, you should feel proud of, of the level of um, of discourse that has happened in Ireland over the last number of years. In academia, we see our role as something similar but different probably more providing an evidence base but absolutely complementary and really happy to engage in forums like this to to have that kind of cross-pollination between the two excellent okay um i know that there i have a list here of, of of other burning issues that have come up and i know there's one on on green hydrogen there's also one on the importance of a just recovery particularly in the context of COVID. and i know COVID was also mentioned and uh, there are a number of questions on agriculture uh, just to say that we did hold an agriculture webinar uh, in May and we um, we published a briefing document um, on emissions reduction in, in the sector. I'm actually just posting that now in the uh, chat box so you, you'll have access to that briefing and the webinar is available on our YouTube channel, uh, Stop Climate Chaos. Um, unfortunately, we just didn't have time to cover everything, but we do hope that uh, this webinar has given you somewhat of an insight into what's in the document uh, from the perspective of uh, our panelists. Um, and of course, a lot of this, a lot of what we do would not really be effective if it wasn't for everyone out there that's been engaging with us and showing interest and supporting us uh, in our work and emailing our TDs, as Sai mentioned. Um, so uh, I think a considerable thank you uh, goes out to all of you for joining us and for engaging with us and for pushing us, uh, particularly with some really uh, great questions here this evening. So thank you. And um, no doubt we will be holding um, more lively and interesting webinars uh, um, if we get a, a, a program this week and if we don't, we'll continue with the webinars anyway. Um, so watch the space and thank you for joining. <coughs>